Hello, good afternoon, everybody, and welcome back to the afternoon session of the ECC annual conference, Engagement Reimagined. I hope you've all had an enjoyable lunch break. Hope you've all had the opportunity to dip into some of the networking and wellness sessions. Okay, so it's on with the conference, and this next session that we're going to go through is going to be a panel interview, which always tests the bounds of our online technology. But this session's all going to be about engaging your people through times of change. And just to contextualize the session, um, this is gonna be a thought leadership and insights uh, slot, which is gonna draw on best practice from not only higher education, but also from a number of different employment sectors to understand how we lead our people through challenging periods uh, that we've had over the last few years and how we face up to some of the social and economic challenges that we find ourselves in, but manage to not only seize the opportunities, but also take our individuals with us through times of change and transformation. I'm delighted to be joined by our panel of experts to offer their insights today. Firstly, Carol Shanahan, OBE, who is the co-owner of Synectic Solutions and the chair of Port Vale Football Club. Anne-Marie Lister, who is the chief people officer at Atom Bank, and then somebody who may be more familiar to us in the HE sector, Emma Brooks from UHR, uh, who is Strategic Projects and Research Manager, um, who will be offering her insights into our own sector and how we can draw on some of these best practices. The session itself is going to be around 30 minutes of Q&A with our panel, and then we'll leave around 10 minutes at the end uh, for anybody to post any questions, which I will uh, put to the panel and, and keep them on their toes with those. Uh, so please use your two bars on the right hand side for chat as we go along if you want to leave any comments and our panelists will look to draw those into the conversation or if you've got a question that you'd like all the panel to consider at the end, please put it on the Q&A tab in the top right. So without further ado, we, we're going to dive straight into covering some of these uh, topics. Um, of engagement and communication and you know what hopefully is this world that presents us on the back of a couple of years with a real opportunity to have change in the workplace and I'm going to kick start really with uh, coming to you Anne-Marie to, to just talk about you know at Atom Bank we've seen things in the news about how you've really tried to place your people at the forefront of your organizational change and I was just wondering if, if you can talk us through what that change has been and how you've ensured that the people have felt valued throughout. Yeah, I, I mean, I'll, I'll start right back at the beginning, actually, very quickly, um, in that um, Atom Bank was born eight years ago as an organisation. We've been trading for six and we've been quite newsworthy, actually, <laughs> for a lot of that time. But actually, right back from the beginning, when we wanted to engage with people to work for us and continue to do so, um, I think it's been really authentic in who you are and what you offer as an organisation and being really quite humble about the knowledge that you have around whatever you're doing, whether it be building a business or implementing a change program you yourself and your leadership team are never going to have all of the answers inviting people into your space and your time and um, to help you come up with the answers and being very honest and clear about that can be actually really motivate motivating and really empowering for people um, and if I think about the change, we moved to a four day week as an organization um, a year ago. Um, no bank had ever done that before. We were the largest employer in the UK at the time and very much in crafting that change and implementation, certainly from my perspective, leading that was, you know, people helping us with the answers people helping us shape what that was going to look like, if it was doable, um, and really understanding how people felt throughout that change. Um, so I think, you know, understanding your people, talking to your people and being authentic in that, um, and acknowledging that they often are the people who have the answers to the change that you want to implement. And Dan-Marie, just in terms of involving people in designing the solution of coming up with a four-day week, what, what was the background to how you did that and, and how you made sure that what you were designing was actually what people would feel a value from? 
Yeah, so I guess um, the, th the thinking around four-day week was kind of aligned to the pandemic, really, in terms of a lot of change that was happening in terms of how we were then working, the hours and the number of hours we were working. So in talking to our people initially, before we even got to four-day week, about how they were feeling, what was the impact on their life, um, what was important to them, the feedback that we got from that was time. My time is really valuable to me, um, and actually more so. Um, so we use a lot of that, as well as looking outside to what was happening in the world around remote working, hybrid working, to see actually what was the solution for Atom. Um, the data from four day a week talks for itself outside of Atom's um, project. You know, the research shows that it can lead to more productive um, uh, workforce, happier well being, and beneficial, profitable, uh, you know, and profitability for organizations. So, in doing that, we thought we're going to give this a go business decision made. Um, but actually, implement implementing it, how would we do that in a contact centre was absolutely up to the head of the contact centre to work with essentially for him to help us figure out how that would happen. The question that I was asked at the beginning was, Anne-Marie, how are you going to design all of these shift patterns? I'm not. <laughs> um, because actually people who are running the operation are those who can make the decisions and craft the right responses and the right solutions. So definitely joint working across the organisation um, and with people to come up with the right answers. Um, and I hope that, that, that helps manage and mitigate risk as well, as well as help people feel empowered over the work that they're doing and how they're feeling about it. Yeah. And, and Carol, just just flipping that back to you so there's definitely something from Anne Marie there about what people value in terms of time and, and certainly that word people not employees is is something that Anne Marie uses a lot just in terms of that that question with with your two different very different types of businesses Cal how how do you ensure that you know people are, are and I know that's important to you but people are at the heart of of how you go through changes in the organizations that you look after Oh, Carol, just need to get you unmuted, Carol. There was, we go. I was That's so a, good. Are you I'm have, Carol. We, we were doing well there. Uh, we can hear you now. It's a skill set we all learned during lockdown, isn't it? Um, and quickly forgotten for me. Um, but no, listening to Anne-Marie, uh, she, she very quickly said the same word as I'd written down, which was authentic. Whatever you do, it has to be authentic. I remember once we had a manager and the staff were coming to me complaining about him. And I said, but, you know, but he's been asking you questions. And he, they said, yeah, that's page 64 of the manu uh, manual for management. You know, it's not because he really cares. Um, and so they, your staff can smell that. If it's not authentic, they can smell it from a mile off. So you've got to, you know, if you ask somebody how they are, you've got to genuinely want to know. Otherwise it's, you know, you might as well not bother. Um, I have a thing about people, uh, I have two phrases. One is that you know, people, all people have sticky out bits and it's, you know, we are not homogenous sort of just lumps. We are all very different. We have all very different needs and making sure that you look after people. I mean, like my PA, Ben, has gone off this afternoon because his young daughter, they've got to go and look at a new school. Um, he hasn't taken a holiday to go and do that. It's really important for him as a father that he goes and does it. And, you know, for me, Ben is a brilliant PA. He's also a brilliant father. And there's room to be both and to be both at the same time. I insist they go to their kids' sports days and they run, you know, go and run in the race, you know, you know go and do that. But you don't have to have holiday to do that. Um, the other thing I have is people who happen to be in the football industry, it's there's areas where people are treated really, really badly and players and fans are two of those. I think, you know, players are treated as if everybody's in the Premier League and they're just paid you know, ridiculous amounts. It isn't like that. It isn't like that in the lower leagues. Um, and so I always say, you know, they're, they're people who happen to be players fans of people who happen to be fans and treating them as people and having that that people base is so important um and so then you know so they have families and you know we look after their families as well and i think that's just you know really important to also understand that if you're doing change is you know what effect is change having on them is it producing fear it will produce fear in most so what is the fear involving them we moved offices and one of the big things for somebody is where would the the wires for the hoovers for the cleaners be in the evening i mean 
what you know but it was a genuine concern for them don't worry that you know you will be fine the hoover you know, the cleaners are coming at a different time when we move it's just a little thing but asking them what do you want us to stop what do you want us to start what do you want us to continue doing and then acting on what they what they say um yeah and Carol, I think one of the big things that, that we learned in the sector from a very traditional operation model was that you have got to know individual, let's say, employees as people now, because we've sat on calls, we've seen in their homes, we've seen the pets, whereas before, perhaps when it was, you no, know, you come to the workplace, then you go home, there was often these barriers between the two. I was just, you know, I, I clearly hear a model there where, yeah, it's a very blended model we get to know an individual as a person and what they'll value just how how helpful is it that when you also own a football club next to your technology company ha has the football club changed that agenda for you and opened up opportunities to almost have that recreational social aspect in the workforce as well as you know what happens um at synectix as a technology company i'm just going to say i'm struggling to hear you a little bit because the heavens have opened oh in um, Stoke on Trent. Um, there's probably people building arcs as we, <laughs> as we speak. It's certainly not going to help our pitch. Um, but so I am struggling to hear you just a little bit. Um, can you just give me the, yeah. the Carol, let, let me let me just try it try it again and if not I'll, I'll come to Emma whilst the, the shower passes. But in terms of the football club, has that opened up opportunities for that family time for you know the, the employment workforce? because there is that recreational aspect to what you can offer staff and, and their families as well. Yes, I mean, you know, we, we're a two team city. Um, and so not everybody who works for us supports us, which is fine. Um, but we're also very much a community club. And um, we have, I mean, tonight we've got a comedy um, club. So our staff um, from both companies can will get um, cheap tickets for that everybody gets you know um, access to the football um, if they want it um, but we can bring clients in and and all sorts of things like that but that isn't really the reason that we bought the club we bought the club to help the community I famously said to Kevin if we really want to help the north of Stoke on Trent we'll go and make Port Vale successful and he said how I said I got a clue um, but we'll go and work it out three years in I'm still working it out um, and what you find is that all organized organizations have the, the same the same base you know it's just that Anne Marie's happens to be about banking mine happens to be about fraud prevention and and detection or happens to be about you know entertainment and, and football but but it, you know and yours with, with HE everything is the same because people are the base of all of our industries um and people have the same things they they have the you know, their their response to change they have their their response to being valued as people and real people you know so it's it's not just how do you do your job but how do we how do we help you so for one thing we put everybody eating together at Port Vale and um, so you you opt in I think we charge 40 quid a month um, and then from that all foods laid out and you can just go and get your breakfast you can go and get your lunch but everybody is together um, so it doesn't matter whether it's me whether it's you know somebody who works in the kitchen one of the players well the players don't eat there because they have to have their salmon broccoli and sweet potato elsewhere um, but um, you know everybody else the manager is in there so it because it doesn't matter what job you're doing we're all trying to to create a very successful football club and community club and we all have our role in that we're, we're all one piece of the jigsaw but we need all the jigsaw that is really profound tell and what I, what is clear is that i'm not going to be a professional footballer because i don't eat enough salmon and broccoli so that's no. out um, no, you're out Carol, there's a clear distinction there as well about, you know, the individual in the workplace and the individual as a person and, and in both their role and as an individual, you have different things that you value. Emma, I was just wondering if I can just bring you in from the, the sector perspective and, and you're in a very privileged position at, at UHR of understanding a lot of practices that go on. I just wonder whether there's anything you can draw on of, of what Amory and uh, Carol have said about practice in their sectors where you see good practice in our sector of valuing individuals as people and, and getting them involved in the design of solutions. 
Absolutely, Ian, and I think two, two of the references that I've come to from both Anne-Marie and Carol are about employee voice and how that can be pivotal to making sure that people feel valued and that they feel heard. Um, we all know that in, in a lot of institutions, there's a whole lot of effort that goes into employee surveys, pulse surveys, taking that data. Um, but it's really important that we do something meaningful with it. People, um, it, it's worse if you do nothing uh, when people give you that information. So you need to be showing that you, you're taking forward uh, the actions. And we've got a really great example of that, um, the UHR team of the year award winners this year were Ulster University um, and their reason for winning was that back in 2017 which seems like a, an aeon ago now but they had a, a an all employee survey um, and that was fairly upfront with what people thought about how people were treated in the institution um, and they did a whole lot, whole lot of work to make sure that the actions were tangible and that people came through that feeling that the, the aspect of how humans and, and human resources were managed was a complete shift. Um, and they've actually said that because going into the, the pandemic, they'd already laid all that groundwork. They were in a much stronger position to go forward and, and deal with the pandemic as a team because people did feel that they were valued by the organisation, their voice had been heard and they'd been instrumental in making the changes necessary to, to lead that organisation through it. So I think that's a really good example coming back to what Carol said about if you're going to go and ask people what they think, then you do need to act on it and you, you can't fudge the answer because people can tell a mile off. Yeah, and perhaps a reflection now, Emma, that we do live in this consumer world now where we expect mm -hmm. to have a say and we, you know, there's no technology limitations that you can't reach out and connect and give people a voice. And I, I think that that comes through loud and clear. Um, I'm going to gonna just switch to the fact that, you know, ECC do a lot of work with organizations about role designs and how do we make people's actual roles interesting that we can motivate them as individuals, but how do we actually make roles interesting in our organizations? And Carol, perhaps if I can come to you first, just in terms of whether it's internal developments or career pathways or promotion opportunities, et cetera, but how do you look at you know, what roles your organization needs and what people will value from their role uh, in the workplace? I think the, that it's very different for the football club to the IT company. You know, the footballers have to kick a ball and that's that. We can't really change that. Um, but for the IT company, um, I mean, we chose the word synectics when we first started the company in 92. Um, the words, this is the days when I was looking through a dictionary, you know, before Google and all the rest of it, you know, the odd books. And I wanted a word around synergy, this sort of coming together to, you know, create something greater than the sum of the parts. And the word synectics was there and it really attracted me because it was the coming together of people with different skill sets to solve a common problem. And that's exactly what we do. And whether that problem is, you know, um, develop, how are we going to develop a new product? How are we going to answer um, a client's um, problem, concern, you know, um, system or the rest of it? We're going to do it together. And so working together um, and, and being able to be free to make suggestions. So if you know, no suggestion is stupid. Um, the only stupid thing is if you have a really good idea and you don't voice it. So, you know, let's hear it. Because even if you don't get it quite right, you might trigger off something else. So for us, um, communicating, being part of a of a group, you know, so teamwork is is really, really important to us. And making sure then that the the role fits the person. And sometimes I mean, I've got one person at Synectics that's had five different jobs, and now they're brilliant because eventually we got the right job for that person. And that's looking at what was it that they, they were actually good at, what, what gave them joy, what got them up in the morning. And to begin with, their CV would have suggested one thing, but actually when you get them in, you find that, no, this is a far better job. Um, and, and not being really stuck into how you're going to create something, because you, know, you, you, you have a, a project and you say, right, we're going to have one of these, two of those, the three of those. But when you get going in the project, that might not be the right way to do that particular project. So don't be, don't be sort of too hung up of, of changing it. 
because sometimes the individuals involved are going to go in their own direction and actually produce something that's that's even better. Yeah, and, and Carol, I love that idea as well that, you know, sometimes in organisations, your role will just be seen as a cog and that is yeah. what you do. But I love the idea that right from the company name, it's this concept, but it, but you're a cog, but it's about how all these cogs work together to make yeah. the, the bigger machine. And, and I, I love that um, as an approach. Um, Anne-Marie, just in terms of, of Atom Bank and, and looking at roles and designing roles to keep them interesting, you know, what I think Carol's saying is that, you know, we, we, we rely on our recruitment process to recruit good people. Sometimes the roles don't fit best their skill set and we all know that skill sets develop. How do you look at keeping roles, you know, fresh, interesting, retaining talent at, at Atom? Um, I think when you start an organisation, every role is interesting, everyone wants to be involved. And I think that thing, you know, over time, lots gets added to roles, roles shift and change. Yes, sometimes to what the organisation needs, but often they become full of stuff that you never really quantified at the beginning. And certainly something we've learned through moving to a four day a week is that there are a lot in some in somebody's day that actually clogs up their role and it stops or it hinders that interesting work. So in moving to a four day a week, we moved from 37 and a half years to 34. Um, sorry, I just it was an echo at my end. Um, to 34, um, you know, meaning that people had a slightly longer day if they wanted to take a four-day week. But actually, people were telling us they were really looking through their day to see what work was of value to the business, to them, and actually stripping it out. You know, people were deselecting from meetings that they didn't need to be in because they could get the information for somebody else. And what all of that means is that they can concentrate on the more interesting work, the work that keeps them, you know, stuck in, plugged into the organisation and keeps them motivated. And I think there's a lot that could be said for inefficiencies in a lot of businesses, but it's not just inefficiencies, it's the work that tends to not be as interesting and engaging. So finding a process that you can review that in some way, if you're not going to move to a four day a week, but being brave as an organization to say, guys, you know, empower, you know, empower people over their days and the work that they're doing to ensure that work is and remains interesting. Yeah, and, it's, and it's it, sorry, oh, just to oh, interrupt, yeah. but it's very much the old thing of urgent and important, isn't it? Of you know, getting your what you've got to do and having the four quadrants. Is it urgent? Is it important? Because we spend to tend to spend quite a lot of time in stuff that's neither urgent nor important. So just scrap it. Just don't do it because that's the noise. That's the bits that you you waste a lot of time on that you don't actually need. Yeah, and, and I'll pose a question to both of you. Do you think sometimes, uh, and I'll come, Carol, I'll, I'll just let you continue, but do you think sometimes we're very slow to review roles and we just keep doing it the same way and, and we do forget sometimes that, you know, actually it, we, we, we just build up and layer up roles and we forget to remove things and we just keep adding to them. And often that is what is demotivational when roles become unsustainable because we just keep layering up but we forget to take things away. Yeah, I always describe it as, you know, when you've lived in a house and you keep having extensions put on and, you know, it might have suited you at the time, but every now and again, you'd have thought, actually, if I'd have wanted to get, you know, here, is is this actually what, what works? Um, one of the, the, the sentences I hate as well is because we always have done. You know, why, why do we do it? Like, well, we've always done it like that. And you take over a football club and you get that a lot is, well, we've always done it like this. Well, yeah, but is it actually achieving what we want to achieve? Um, I think it's really important to make sure in your team you get some disruptors. And I think people sometimes move away from disruptors, get a bit fearful of them um, because they, you know, they can be loose cannons and you don't know where they're going to go. I love having some disruptors. I'm a disruptor um, and I love having disruptors work for me, uh, positive ones, um, because I like everything to be questioned all the time. Um, I like feedback. So every time, you know, whether it's at Synectix um, or Port Vale, everything we do, we always keep reviewing it. You know, how do we do? Could we have done better? Um, and, and not be afraid to change. You know, if you if you say, hang on, we've had this three times now, surely there's a better way that we can do that. For me, it makes it a far more exciting um, and interesting place to work than just repeating the same thing over and over again. Yeah. Anne-Marie, do you just want to add to that in terms of, of roles and, and maybe a little bit of disruption and shaking things up 
um, is, is sometimes a good thing when you have people who look at roles from that perspective. Yeah, absolutely, and totally agree. I love the the analogy of kind of the the extensions, um, it, because it, it does happen in that way. And I think both from an individual perspective, you building your role in some respects, but also what the organisation might overlay onto that. But I think there's also a responsibility for organisations in this as well to say, actually, looking across what happens in the business, what has become unnecessary, and really mm -hmm. challenging. You know, why are we sitting here? What is the purpose of this meeting, and what do we want? to get out of it you know what's the purpose of that report that i'm being asked to produce every week no one even looks at it and it's having those brave conversations both from an individual and an organization perspective but again it's working in an environment when you can allow and have those conversations where people don't feel like they're you know i love the disruptor piece we are a disruptor as an organization but i think creating an environment where people feel comfortable saying that in that it's not a negative thing it's a general challenge to the status quo you know we talk about challenging the status quo as a business it's what we value um, and allowing people to do that uh, but both the business reminding itself that it needs to do it i think you can come up with some great things and continue again with that interesting work and interesting roles yeah so, so disruptors definitely um attract disruptors so atom bank have been a client of synectics for the past seven years and so we've worked and you might not realize that but um, I, I didn't actually i should maybe i yeah. should know that <laughs> yeah no no we've, we've worked together for for the past seven years so you know and it's definitely you know if you're that that sort of company that you do you do attract you do attract those sort of people you do attract those sort of clients um and we attract those sort of players so it, it is a good you know you know once you get that energy out there it it really is beneficial there you go, Anne-Marie. There's always a link. I thought Carol was going to say, and we haven't paid the bill for, for several... No, not, not at all. <laughs> Emma, they're, very good. they're very good payers. Excellent. <laughs> Emma, just bring in some sector, and I'm, I'm deep in the analogy of something about we either need to declutter the house or you have to move house. It's one or the two, but <laughs> just bring me into some, uh, some sector practices around how we're looking at designing roles and, and some of that retention side about keeping roles interesting. Mm. You know, what... What I think Cal and Anne-Marie are saying, look, a bit of disruption here and there. You've got, you've got to do something a bit more significant than just keep tweaking and going along sometimes. Tell, yeah. tell me about some of our sector practices that you see at UHR. So I, I think one of the things I would say is I probably, like many people on this call, have spent a lot of time doing job evaluation and, and breaking down the components of job descriptions. But I think one of the things we're, we're bad for in our sector is leaving it until there's a role that's vacant to review that job description. And that's at the crunch point when the manager has a vacancy they're desperate to fill and there's no time to do that work and do it right and decide if that is still the right requirements for the, what the team needs. I think there's moving on from that. I think where our sector could learn a great deal is around talent management, um, understanding where our talent sits and then providing them the opportunities to stretch, to be challenged, to get those whether it's leading a project, working on a project, working in um, secondments across the university. There's lots of opportunities there that people could step slightly outside the job description, but for their own advancement and then making them a much stronger candidate. Those are the ways that you're gonna retain the talent that you need to retain because otherwise they'll get those opportunities elsewhere. And we know that recruitment and retention is critical um, across our sector at the moment. I think one of the possible ways that the, the sector could move forward next, we've got a number of institutions that have really good experience in academic career frameworks. Um, so for instance, Sheffield Hallam um, recently won an award for theirs, uh, but it's about how we now might move that experience into a professional services context. So whether that's career frameworks, career pathways, but just so people can have a really tangible experience of where their career might go, um, within that institution or whether it's a case of um, providing them with additional skills and experience to, to do what the organisation is going to need in the next five years, not just right now. Yeah, absolutely, Emma. I think we all know that often that knee jerk, if you don't take time, is to when when you've got an opportunity and somebody leaves the organisation is just to put the job description back out there without actually yeah. redesigning the role, even though somebody may have been doing it for many, many years. OK, I'm going to flip the conversation now and just talk about that sense of community. And I'll just give everybody a, a quick five minute warning that if you've got questions, we're going to do rapid fire questions because the 
the conversation is really flowing. So please pop questions in the Q&A now. Carol, I know how important community is to you as an individual, but talk me through briefly how you've, you know, embedded behaviors and values in your two organizations to create that culture of community and, and how perhaps the role of leadership uh, is, is a big part of that and leading by example. Yeah, I'm just I'm going to be a bit naughty because I'm just going to answer. I'm just going to follow on from what Emma's just said, and then I'll go on to the community. Absolutely. Um, I have um, invested this year in Port Vale in a growth, learning, and development um, head of growth, learning, and development. I was really pleased because the acronym was Glad, and our goal is <laughs> uh, is Glad all over. So I was going right. That's it. We want to be Glad all over. You know, that's how we score. Um, and so everybody his job now is to make sure that every single person in port vale has a growth plan and anybody who joins us has to be okay with having a growth plan you know um comf being comfortable with where you are is is not okay you know we've all growing um so that's i just wanted to say that because that's a really important part of what makes us different from the other 91 um football clubs and, and that think, works really well Carol, doesn't it? The, the glad works really well with your goal celebration song at Paul. That's lucky. I can't tell you how pleased I was about that. But then I went a bit acronym stupid and then I got told to stop. So and it, and it didn't work for the roles. No, they have let me go with just glad all over. Um, but so community, Carol. Tell me a bit community. about embedding community. Yeah, community is is really important. And I think that for for us as individuals, it's it's very easy to get stuck in our role and what we do in our professional role. When you start to work in the community, you realize that actually there's a whole lot more that we can do. There's a whole lot more skill sets that we've got and parts of, of us that don't in the day-to-day -day, um, way get, get, you know, um, get a breath you know whereas if you start to go and do something whether it's voluntary work or whatever it is for me that has has made a huge difference in the past sort of eight years and I really wanted to take that and give both my organizations everybody in them the opportunity to do the same so we all have the opportunity to work within the community we have um our we have two charities. We have one, which is the Port Vale Foundation, um, that does everything. Um, this morning, I was at a Golden Valiant session, singing the wonder of you, and I just missed the bingo, thank goodness. Um, but I, yeah, you go in there, and there's a hundred people over sixty-five, and that's their their way of coming together. Um, we do the Hub Foundation, which is giving food and activities to underprivileged kids during school holidays. But the um, so the north of Stoke-on-Trent needs support and the local authority has not got the resource to do it. Even if they've got the, 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 the will to do it, which I know they have, they haven't got the resource. So coming together, bringing people together and using our, our uh, professional skills to help um, really, really makes such a difference. And, uh, and using a football club, um, I'm on the board of the EFL Trust. Uh, which is the, the 72 um, community organisations that go with each football club and taking that across the country, um, every single one of those performs a really important function um, within their community. So I think that, you know, to go back to where in the 50s and the 60s, we all have that sort of more of a sense of, of you know, um, of what we, what we have to give rather than what we have to receive. From society and i i feel that particularly during lockdown i saw that swing back to hang on what do we want to give and as organizations we can facilitate that and yeah. uh, it's very rewarding when we do so important Carol. i think we found at, at our university that bingo seemed to get us through most of the pandemic and to, to keep spirits high so i think we're all onto something there um yeah. and marie what carol's saying there is almost something about if we if we engage individuals in that sense of belonging in a community that that personal satisfaction is almost as rewarding as as the the job satisfaction a lot of the time and certainly the way we're working in in different ways now how you build a sense of community can be a bit more challenging when we're not all sat together quite as often how have you approached community at atom 
So I think organizations are communities, aren't they? They're communities of people that come together that are either motivated or interested in what you are doing, selling, being, creating. Um, you know, and I think organizations that have really definite, clear um, missions and purposes in the world, whatever their organization is doing, will appeal to people and bring together a community of people that are motivated by exactly that. Um, we don't talk about values very much at Atom, but we have them. We have things that are important to us. And we created an environment that actually show people by doing it um, what is important to us. So, you know, we talk about challenging the status quo, you know, making work interesting for people, giving people the power over the work that they do to make sure that they can challenge the status quo in what they do. You know, as an organization, challenging banking as an industry is by the very nature of what we're doing from a digital perspective, but actually from a people perspective, four day a week, we're challenging the status quo there. So, you know, we're doing it, we're being it. And I think actually, you know, we didn't need to be in a room full of people to do that. We needed to be able to communicate with them, you know, join up with them, make sure we had good two way channels, you know, all of the rest of it. But I think going back to this employee voice, people feeling heard, seen, yeah, and that their feelings are noticed, um, you know, and, and in that responding is, is as you would, it creates an energy in itself. Energy is another thing that's really important to us. So I think for, from, from our perspective, people will be drawn to your organization by the very purpose of it, and you will bring a community of people together, mm -hmm. staying true to who you are, doing things mm -hmm. when you say you're going to do them, and at taking action quickly, I think um, is really important. Um, communities can disappear as well, can't they? If they, you don't see things happening, you think I'm not part of this anymore. Um, so I think for me, organizations that do things and act quickly and when they can, will continue to build a strong community. And Emma, examples of building strong communities in HE? Yeah, I think it's absolutely right. Uh, what Anne-Marie said about pulling together and focusing on the mission, the culture, the purpose, the values, those are really bringing it back to the basics. And I think sometimes it takes a little time to articulate what that is and what good looks like. Um, I'm very proud to have spent for seven years at the University of Salford and there, whilst there we implemented the Salford behaviours, which is a, a set of behaviours that we expect all our colleagues to, to visibly display. And there's ways you can then progress that into appraisal, into development, into recruitment, so that you're making it very clear from the outset what it is that you want to see in, in people at that, that institution. Um, and the other thing I would bring through is that the concept of starting with why, so and then working your way out from that. So the, the very purpose, and that can be a big exercise across a, an institution or a small exercise in a team. So doing something that just focuses on the why and then the how and then the what, but you're really helping people connect from their individual role to that core purpose of the team, of the department or of, of the organization. If you can link that golden thread and people can see that what they do really makes a difference and to that core mission, then people are gonna be much more engaged. Fantastic, Emma. Okay, we've only got a few minutes left. Where has that time gone? But I'm going to do rapid fire Q&A just to see if we can get through some of them. Um, Carol, going to come to you first for a quick response. Um, does one size fit all? How do we design uh, around, if we're talking about a person, people's individual needs? How do you try to bespoke what you offer to meet individuals' needs? Or is it we offer a lot of things and there's something for everybody? I, I was told very early on not to make something a policy, to keep, keep discretion as much as we could in our policies, because once you start to write something down, we will always do this. It then it then forces a structure and people don't really fit into that structure. And without that, we could actually give a lot more. Um, so it's making sure that all of our managers, because you have to, I mean, we haven't had a chance to talk my whole theory on Middle Earth because <laughs> you want to do it right. At the bottom, people are doing it right. Middle Earth is where the issues happen because that's where they have the power to say no. Um, and so making sure your message gets through Middle Earth is really, really important. But that's our whole different panel. 
We're doing that one next year, Carol. Anne-Marie, yeah. quick question for you. Is it scary being a pioneer doing something that others aren't doing? Um, yes, is the answer. <laughs> um, if I, yeah, I wouldn't be being true to myself or anyone in the business if I you know, wouldn't tell you that I was terrified once the chief executive had accepted and the board had accepted the proposal of doing a four day a week or even you know, doing anything in the, in the banking world that we do, because I couldn't say at that point whether it would absolutely work. You know, I'd done the research, we'd done some planning, but I think being brave and creating an environment and some trust with your people to say, come with us on that journey made me feel feel better about it but I think you know if you're going to do something different and you're going to do something challenging that is going to make a big difference it is going to be scary you know and one of my favorite phrases is you know feel the fear and do it anyway um you know if you're really going to stand out from the crowd you know make sure you do but it isn't always going to feel great and um, but I can say a year later we've absolutely reaped the rewards and the benefits of it and it actually really does feel great now yeah, and perhaps uh, a quick question for all of you, allowing paid time off for volunteering in your organisations. Uh, Carol, do you allow staff time off to do um, organisational uh, community volunteering? Yes. Fantastic. Anne-Marie? Yes, we do. Yes, we do. And Emma, I think you'll say in the sector, is that becoming more of a common practice? I think practice? Make, makes a practice, but I think certainly is one of those um, extra areas of of reward and benefits that people could add in that isn't a direct cost but um, a productivity cost but will be boosting engagement I think it might become more common. Brilliant I'm going to squeeze in one final question for the panel um, in your organization how do you motivate people to change who are content in what they do uh, but that's no longer aligned to where the organization wants to be so the the non-believers uh, Carol in terms of people who don't don't want to change is there a place for them still it can be i mean there's not a, a yes or no answer to that but very often it's um just the expression that Amory's just used it's the fear um and it's taking them through the and do it anyway part of that saying um and because people are very afraid of or not all people but some people are very afraid of change um and so to address those fears early and often is really important and Anne-Marie, I'll give you the uh, the final say on this one and then I'll draw the session to a close. But the were there any non, non-believers who you had to take on the journey of your change to the four day week? Yeah, I, I guess non-believers, probably more just um, the depth, the, the, the feeling overwhelmed with the amount of change, I think, and going through that change cycle of generally denial. My goodness, this is never, of course, we're not going to do this to, oh my goodness, I've now got to do four days work in five, which was never going to be the case. But I think continuing to provide support, talking to people and figuring out how can we make it work for you is always you know, going to help. We haven't had anyone that specifically left us for that reason to say this isn't for me, because again, we, we planned in flexibility. Um, but I always think you know there are strength people have strengths and if they don't fit in one part of the organization they may well fit somewhere else and I think it's the value and the richness of the conversations you can have with people before you get to that end point in the road but yes um, we've worked through all of that um, but you know being honest in how you're approaching things um, it is always it is always key for me it's a good leadership skill quality um, and it helps you know really get things done and some real refreshing insights there, Anne-Marie, over, you know, sometimes the role doesn't always fit the individual, but but let's see where we can fit the individual in. And, and Carol's view of, you know, we're, we're on role number five, trying to find the best fit for their skills and, and that fits for the individual. So so absolutely fantastic. OK, we're, we're slightly over time, everybody. But if I can just ask you with your virtual claps and thumbs ups to just thank our panel today that have joined us for what is a, it's been a, a truly leadership insightful conversation so thank you to Anne-Marie thank you to Carol I'm pleased that we could join together your two organizations which is clearly happening in the background somewhere welcome to the world of business and and a hundred percent thank you to Emma for adding you know our sector insights and and the great work that UHR do alongside ECC for all of higher education so thank you all and I'm sure we might refresh this session next year just to see how things have progressed in the workplace Thank you to everybody who's participated with your questions and input on the chat. I'm going to end the session now. You'll spin back out to the lobby on the platform. Um, so it's goodbye from the panel. 
and we'll hope to see you for the next session, which I believe starts at 2.30 after a short coffee break. So thank you, everybody. Enjoy the rest of the conference.